Hi everyone and welcome back to the George Collection. I'm Rachel Right Side Blonde. Today I wanted to bring you the Mel Gibson cover about the New Patriots. This article is from July of 2000 and I found it extremely educational and informative so I thought I'd read it to you kind of as a history lesson. So here we go. The article is called Mel Gibson Pops an American Myth. As a kid you were taught about the citizen soldier. While making the Patriot, Mel Gibson learned that many deserted, others fought among themselves, and if it weren't for the mercenaries, we'd all be speaking with a British accent. They were frazzled and filthy. They were homesick and blood spattered, but mostly they were tired of fighting. The British are coming, the British are coming. Let them come. In droves, American soldiers abandoned their positions and slipped back into the shadows of civilian life. War is hell, apparently even when you're shooting blanks. During the three weeks to film the climatic battle of the Patriot, Mel Gibson's new movie about the American Revolution Half of the 750 extras went AWOL from the Backwoods, South Carolina set, simply up and walked away from their $60 a day plus overtime temp job. They were fed up with shouldering rifles 15 hours at a stretch, sick of the dirt and the heat and those stinky woolen uniforms. Hmm, sound familiar? In fact, that's what the American militia did most of the time in the Revolutionary War, just took off. They beat it every chance they had, says Gibson, chuckling at the high desertion rates that had General George Washington grinding his wooden teeth to sawdust in his sleep. But just as the producers managed to round up enough replacements to keep the Patriot rolling along, so too did the Continental Army manage to hold firm and whip a better prepared, more color-coordinated British foe. And when the dust from the war settled, the rough outlines of the new country's heroic persona were visible, that of the beat-the-odds underdog the resourceful, rugged, individualistic, who would go on to tame the West, keep the world safe for democracy, and invent the automobile and cable TV. The figurative source of the Nile when it comes to our national character is the Minuteman with his musket, the citizen, soldier, statesman heeding the call to duty. The Patriot is riffing on the theme of that first American hero at a curious time, when the country seems to be simultaneously clamoring for shining stars and yet confused when it comes to spotting them. Millennial America is no high tide for traditional heroes, but new ones do crop up. The article goes on to say, just before Christmas, the Patriot production crew descended upon the College of Charleston to shoot some pivotal scenes at its stately administration building, which has a cameo role as the home of the South Carolina Assembly circa 1776. Gibson was there playing Benjamin Martin, a full-time farmer, a part-time legislator, and a veteran of the French and Indian Wars with some grisly combat skeletons in his closet. Martin is a man racked by conflicting obligations to his family and his country to be. He comes before the assembly to argue against funding a beefed up South Carolina militia, an act of provocation that would surely be deemed treasonable by King George. This war will be fought, not on the frontier nor on distant battlefields, but in our own backyards, Martin warns. Our children will learn of it with their own eyes. I will not fight, and I will not cast a vote that will send others to fight in my stead. It's not giving away too much of the plot to reveal that circumstances conspired to change Benjamin Martin's mind. Producers don't pay Mel Gibson around $25 million to pay a conscientious objector with great buns. Martin winds up accepting a field commission as a colonel in the South Carolina militia, which soon has him reaching for his mothballed muskets and tomahawks. Gibson was appropriately dressed for that big speech, looking very Williamsburg chic in a faux ponytail, black waistcoat, knee-high breeches, and silver buckle shoes. Between camera calls, he sat in a director's chair underneath mighty oak trees and reflected upon those gritty colonists. You look at the gravestones around here, he said. They're all like 47 years old when they croak. I wouldn't be far away from the grave right now. Tough times, tough people. The Continental Army was known to crank out 200-mile marches at the drop of a tri-cornered hat. Food and pay were sporadic. It was, therefore, not uncommon to see soldiers pause on the battlefield to cut a dead man's teeth out of his head. Yield dentists paid a bounty for the raw materials they needed to make top-of-the-line dentures. You know how they used to vaccinate them against smallpox? Gibson continued. They'd get a guy who had smallpox, and they'd get a needle and thread, and run it through one of the postules. Then they'd run it under their own skin, and you'd still stand like a 50% chance of dying. I mean, imagine being the donor, 
Hiya, bud. You're dying, but you got a great looking postural there. Mind if I stick a needle in you? The article continues. It is a very powerful image, says Charles Royster, a history professor at Louisiana State University. That image of the rifleman from out of the mountains comes the man who beats the British. Biographer M. Scott Berg, who most recently tackled Charles Lindbergh, says the solitary citizen soldier is a fitting inspirational figure for a nation built on dreams and new beginnings. America has always been attracted to the trailblazers, says Berg. I think we're especially attracted to the loners, those who do it first and do it by themselves. The only glitch is that those celebrated weekend warriors didn't win the Revolutionary War. That honor belongs to the Continental Army and its faithful French allies who together did the lion's share of the down and dirty soldiering. Continentals served three-year hitches and tromped up and down the East Coast, both pursuing and being pursued by the British Army. They constituted about 80% of America's fighting force. Locals pitched in here and there with decidedly mixed results. The militia people, who were called out for a period of not more than nine months, were mostly farmers, and they didn't like it, and did it under duress, says Royster. Most of this heroic Minuteman image comes from the Battle of Lexington and Concord in April 1775, and then becomes sort of affixed in literature and in myth because it seems to reflect this victory of the British by the people at large. Until the Cold War, really professional soldiers were looked down upon by most Americans. Gary Wills devotes part of his new book, A Necessary Evil, to discrediting the prevailing notion that Revolutionary War militias were down-home but well-oiled fighting machines. To the contrary, he reports, about 20% of the militiamen deserted and the rest were widely regarded as inept. A Mayberry-ish collection of Barney Fife and drummers, if you will. As for come to the aid of my country volunteerism, in most states, free white males were required to serve in the militia, although wealthy free white males had the option of paying somebody to go kill redcoats for them. Enticements of post-war land grants or a healthy slave were occasionally employed to get militiamen to fulfill their active duty commitments. The militias did provide a useful service, functioning as a quasi-police force that maintained order, if not exactly domestic tranquility. Roughly one-third of the newly minted Americans favored independence, one-third remained loyal to the crown, and one-third wanted to be left alone to go about their daily business, and the hell with King George and George Washington. The militias kept the loyalists in check and watched for signs of the British stirring rebellion among the slave and Indian populations, but how valuable were they as troops? Wills quotes Thomas Jefferson as once tartly remarking that no possible mode of carrying on the war can be so expensive to the public and so distressing and disgusting to the individuals as by militia. These ragtag gangs not only couldn't shoot very straight, often they didn't even have guns. Michael Bell Siles, a history professor at Emory University, reviewed more than a thousand probate wills from 1765 to 1790. He found that just 14% of adult males owned guns, and that more than half those weapons weren't in firing condition. Bell Siles estimates that during the revolution, about one gun was in circulation for every 10 people. There are now as many guns in America as there are Americans. The article continues on about the movie, and then continues on to say, producer Devlin had no qualms about Gibson playing the part, but he was concerned about the off-camera flack, given all the talk that floats around about his star's wacky right-wing politics. Not to worry, Gibson is something of the local hero on his film sets. Mel, the practical jokester and serial burper. Mel, the regular bloke who hangs with the crew instead of hunkering down inside some power trip Winnebago. The article discusses Gibson's move to Australia and goes on to say, Gibson never became an Australian citizen. Four of the five homes that he and his wife Robin own are in the U.S., where Gibson relishes his odd alien status and reputation for unconventional politics, largely inherited from his conservative Catholic father. He thinks a cabal of Rhodes scholars is taking over the world. He says governing bodies and leaders are capable of major crimes, such as lying to get us into wars. One of his favorite films is Oliver Stone's JFK, the conspiracy buff's Casablanca. Gibson says that the criticism Stone received from playing footsie with the facts was a totally predictable media hose job. In fact, the Warren Commission was the biggest bunch of crap you can imagine, but nobody bothers to smear that. Know what I mean? But as cynical as Gibson professes to be, he hasn't lost faith in heroes. Years ago, he devoured Joseph Campbell's classic book, A Hero with a Thousand Faces a rumination on the importance of myth in societies across the ages. 
Gibson has since acquired more than a passing familiarity with heroes from having played so many. I don't think it's an antiquated notion, he says. We need heroes. We need those people to show us the way, to show us what we can be and need to be. On the set of The Patriot, Gibson would occasionally grab a megaphone and start improvising in the creepy, heavily German accent of his alter ego, Klaus. Klaus is the personification of inner doubt and fear, a perpetual storm cloud of negativity. All is lost, Klaus would inform the Patriot crew. You will cease in this fruitless endeavor. There's a bit of Klaus in everyone. There's a lot of him in Gibson. Typically, Gibson is favorably impressed with the noble cause aspects of the American Revolution. But on the other hand, it was the same old, same old, just another bloodbath, tug of war for money and power. Still, you have to admire Benjamin Martin and those spunky colonists. Sort of. I can sympathize with the character that doesn't really want to go to war with England, he says. They're outgunned. It's a miracle they pulled it off. How'd they get it together? George Washington didn't win many fights. He won some minor battles, you know, but usually he got his ass whipped. George did, however, pull it off. His army did give birth to a new nation, a nation whose citizens are nowadays almost blissfully unaware of what got pulled off and by whom. We've lost sight of the whole premise that being heroic means sacrifice and doing something for others, says Juanita Firestone, who teaches sociology at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Since 1988, Firestone has asked her students to list heroes. Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi are perennial favorites, she says, but after that, the lists go rapidly downhill, with Madonna being considered one of the most esteemed women in America. Looks like the late historian Barbara Tuckman nailed it correctly. She once said that the mark of a society in a state of collapse is its inability to distinguish between heroes and celebrities. Yet all is not lost. It can't be when Klaus Gibson remains a believer. He eventually does dredge up a hero, a helicopter pilot he saw interviewed in a documentary about the Vietnam War, a nobody, a genuine somebody. He did his best to do his best, Gibson says. Those kinds of guys, it's almost like they're from another era, kind of like a knight, you know? I hope those guys are still around. I hope I could be one of those guys if I had to be. So much awesome information in this article, I felt like it was literally a history lesson and I hope you enjoy it too. And also some interesting quotes from what Gibson believed back in 2000 about a cabal of scholars running the world. Just seems really familiar. What I love about this cover is that it talks about America's new patriots, the power of America's new patriots. I almost feel like we're creating a new political class that is all America first and that will be dubbed the new patriots. What do you think? That does it for this episode of the George Collection. I hope you enjoyed. Have a great week and I'll see you next time. George, which is a hoot of a magazine. I thought you were a lawyer. I was. What happened? Well, we uh, we decided, I mean, actually taking a cue from, from folks like yourself and you around the 1992 election, that, that there was an opportunity here to uh, change the definition of a political magazine. Uh, certainly the way Americans were uh, accessing information about politics and politicians was changing. Uh, candidates were appearing on late night talk shows, on talk radio, on sitcoms, uh, and there was a, a kind of a leveling process, and while the rest of media clearly had caught up with that, we felt that political magazines, per se, hadn't. Your mother was a hell of an editor at Doubleday. That's what I hear. Would she have liked George? I think she would have.